the go. Great. Um, so um, before we get into this evening's session, um, any thoughts or comments or wisdom or reflections from last time or? Doesn't need to be, just asking in case anything to hoover up. Great, okay. In which case, I can't see any hands. Um, so we will move straight into this evening's session. Jackie, welcome back. You're on mute there, Jackie. Okay, yes, thank you. Great, and um, so I think you're gonna lead the first half. So shall I get the slides up? Yes, please, yes. Let me do that with alacrity. Um, oh, let me just let Ian Levitt in. Um, and now I will share. If you have alacrity, it sounds like you might need heat. Well, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> have alacrity. <laughs> that is now, lovely. Yeah, oh, no, you. wait a minute. Now, uh, what I've not done. Uh, That's the end. Yeah, it's starting. Uh, let me just, it's going to play silly, silly people, is it? Right. Let me. Um, uh, let me just see about how I can get this properly done. So I'm going to go just onto my little screen here and try doing it this way round. Oh, there's still some people coming in. Um, let me try this way round. Now, why is it starting at the end? No idea. Let's That's see right. if I can get it to start at the beginning. Um, this is the one. That's the one. That's the one. But when I go to slideshow from the beginning, it goes to the end. How bizarre, how bizarre. We're going to have to do it this way around then so that I just do it through that way. OK, so is that good enough? Yes, it's, uh, that's fine. I Great. Think. OK, before that, there's um, is there a, there's a scripture to read, isn't there, which I haven't yeah, actually That's read. right. So um, so in your participants books, everybody, we're on to session three, developing helpful skills and attitudes. But um, before we get to that, yeah, let me. Why is it not even clicking on? Oh, well. Yeah. <clears throat> so, Jackie, do you want to read the scripture or do you want me to? If you, if you, you wouldn't mind reading that. And then if I take it then from where we begin with self-awareness, will that be OK? Yeah, sure. OK, so we're, we're looking at Mark 7, 31 to 37. Uh, you'll remember we each time we meet, we have a... Um, a healing of Jesus and just a couple of comments on it. Um, so this one is Mark 7 and it's Jesus curing a deaf man. Then Jesus returned from the region of Tyre and went by way of Sidon towards the Sea of Galilee in the region of the Decapolis. They brought to him a deaf man who had an impediment in his speech and they begged him to lay his hand on him. He took him aside in private away from the crowd and put his fingers into his ears, and he spat and touched his tongue. Then looking up to heaven, he sighed and said to him, Ephatha, that is, be opened. And immediately his ears were opened, his tongue was released, and he spoke plainly. Then Jesus ordered them to tell no one, but the more he ordered them, the more zealously they proclaimed it. They were astounded beyond measure saying, he has done everything well. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute to speak. Hmm. So the reason we, uh, we chose that for tonight, um, well, not least, we'll be talking about um, the laying on of hands and uh, the use of touch and the such like. Um, but in the modern Roman Catholic rite of baptism, you may or may not know that the priest actually touches the ears and the mouth of the newly baptized person and says, the Lord Jesus made the deaf hear and the dumb speak. May he soon touch your ears to receive his word 
and your mouth to proclaim his faith to the praise and glory of God the Father. Which is uh, really interesting because what, 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 what the Roman Catholic Church is pointing out there is that this miracle in Mark 7 is something we all need for ourselves uh, by God's grace to have ears able to hear. Um, however we understand the fall in Genesis, it does uh, include a sense of our being born uh, spiritually somewhat um, insulated, uh, instinctively self-centered and self-enclosed. Uh, we need ears opening and tongues loosening in different ways. And indeed, when we're beginning to think about, as we are in this session, uh, the skills and attitudes we bring, the visiting we do, uh, part uh, of our prayer in all this must be to truly hear and have tongues loosed by the Holy Spirit, uh, to be vehicles of the Holy Spirit in enabling others to hear and respond to. So that's um, something of why this passage is for tonight. Okay, so the next slide. Yep. Okay, so um, tonight we are looking at helpful skills and attitudes, as you can see from the title. And really, it's actually about us developing those skills and attitudes. And the question asked on the screen there is how well do we know ourselves? How we see ourselves will affect our regard of others. So you could try to make some notes if you'd like to, to write your autobiography using the following headings. But first of all, there's a warning. Looking at this can sometimes be a little inward looking, but it's good to know yourself and your limitations. I might say that uh, I'm a, a trained counsellor, but I'm really not very good at it. Um, and I found it very, very difficult to have to search myself before I could actually help others. It took me quite a long time to do it. So I would suggest it'll be the same for you. We're at the beginning of a learning curve here. So before the next slide, um, there are, which, which have got some headings, ask yourself some of these questions. Do you know yourself to be loved by God? Do you know that you are made in God's image? Do you know that we are all forgiven sinners? Do you know that it's only by grace that we can stand, only through the grace of Jesus Christ? And do we know that God knows the plans he has for us and that they are plans to prosper us and not to harm us? Plans to give us a hope and a future scripture that you know very, very well. And also it might be worth thinking about how you actually define yourself. Is it by what God says or by what humans say? And you're going to meet people face to face who will be fighting with that question. We go to the next slide, please, Mike. Okay, now the following sections truly is for you to write privately. But for tonight's purpose, the idea is that you think about writing your autobiography using the following headings, maybe as an example, and they're there on the screen. Looking at go my goals and priorities in life. Being aware of past influences, past experiences that will influence your life now. So something might have happened to you as a child um, and or maybe sort of er early in your Christian life and you're still trying to work through that. Then there's the question of your strengths and weaknesses. And we all have problems, don't we, in putting down our strengths, but we all have them. 
and asking yourself, how do I compensate for weaknesses? And what drives and dominates my thoughts on a day-to-day -day basis? And how do I respond to criticism and direction? And how do I say, and how do I show that I care? How do people who care for you express it? Is it by touch? Is it by gifts? Is it by words, words of affection or of help, um, of time? Can we go to the next slide, please? I think that will fit in with that. Oh, that's odd. Lost yes, the slide, I'm afraid. Say knowing ourselves. Can it go to then? Yes, that's all right. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Yes, please. Thank you very much. Yes, this, this exercise is from the Growing in Wholeness course. And it's good to ask where you are on the dotted lines in between each statement. So, for instance, if you look to the left there, you're, it says there, um, put, putting yourself down. Um, such things as God blundered when he made me, I will never be any good. But at the other end, the positive side of that is believing that God doesn't make mistakes, that I'm a valuable person because he made me. And most of us sit somewhere on the line between self put down and self esteem. Then there comes to self pity. Things like I'm not clever or I'm not good looking or nobody really loves me. Across to self acceptance on the other side, where it says, whatever my weakness is, I'm a whole person. God has given me all I need to live life. And then there's self defeat on the left hand side there. Things like, and I'm sure we have all said things like this, there is no point in trying because I know I'll fail, I'll never make it. Through to being confident at the other end there, saying, I can do anything God wants me to do. And failure makes me try harder. You go to the next slide, please. I think, I think it should be the next slide. No, can you go back again? Sorry. <laughs> Nothing worse than not having the slides all in front of you. Then consider maybe where you were 12 months ago. Then perhaps you could draw an arrow in which direction you're going and in which way you're traveling. So looking at my, putting myself down on the left-hand side to self-esteem on the other, where will you be? on that dotted line. It's not something you can do immediately now, but really worth thinking about. And then there's the whole issue, which we've mentioned already about self-pity versus self-acceptance. And then self-defeat through to self-confidence with those words that I've mentioned to you once before. Okay, we all sit somewhere on that. And I think I've probably moved from one to the other and back and forth, as I'm sure that you have as well. So, but that's really all about knowing yourself. Could you move to the next slide, please, Mike? Okay, when we've got here, um, that word, a very grand word there, pronouncements. Okay, and the first thing is, Negative statements made about us can become curses. Things like, gosh, you're no good. You'll never change. No one will want to marry you. Never trust men. Big boys don't cry. You'll never make it. And I thought about this for quite a long time today. But my story in this is in the culture of my family and lots of people would have had this experience. My story would be is that my father thought that because I was a girl, he'd noticed I was a girl, which was good. He noticed I was a girl. And he, what he actually said to me was, you don't need to do exams. 
you don't actually need to really stay at school because you're only going to get married and have children. And then your job is to look after your husband. So for quite a few years, I got, I got stuck there. And you'll find that there are lots of people who would have actually had that kind of experience. And often, of course, there is the word of God, which sometimes when talking to people can actually be misused. Beware of negative words like never or always or can't or won't. The positive aspect is that God's words are always creative and redemptive. They're not there to threaten you. Jesus is the word of God, as you know, from um, John chapter one. And our words should be like his, straightforward and gentle and kind and understandable. Healing comes from hearing and accepting God's word for us, forgiving those who've spoken lies to us and rejecting those lies. So we all, all of us have a long journey to meet and you know, to be on and everybody that we actually meet um, through the healing ministry will probably have had lots of these experiences. They'll come feeling negative and not positive. Could you move to the next slide, please, Mike? And looking at inner vows, thinking about negative statements we make about ourselves, like, gosh, I'll never forgive myself for, or I'm, I'll, oh, I'm, I'll always do that. I'm ugly, I'm useless, I can never show my emotions. Please remember that healing comes from hearing God's description of us and to repent of believing untruths about ourselves. As one scripture is example is from Isaiah 43, four, where it says, since you are precious and honored in my sight, and I love you. Those kind of scriptures are worth memorizing so that you can just repeat them to yourself, that you know that you're loved. So the importance of self-awareness, which I think is on the next slide, please, Mike, is um, our attitude towards others. What we think of ourselves can spill over onto others. And that's the idea now of becoming more self-aware of your, your own situation. It doesn't mean that you still can't help to the healing of others because we are all wounded healers as on Renew On, it's a wonderful book if you ever get a chance to actually read it. And what we are communicating or what we think we're communicating isn't always what comes out. So for instance, communication is 55% nonverbal. And 8% um, of that would also be tonal. That means really how we say things. And only 7% of speech, what we actually say is community, is, is, um, is us communicating to other people. So what we need to do really is to take care of our approach to others. Think always about what you're thinking, what you're thinking and what you're about to say. I'd like you to look for the moment at the following two slides. Could you turn to the next one, please, Mike? This is called a cycle of grace, as you can actually see. And the second one will be a cycle of works. Now on this flow chart here, um, it shows Kolb cycle of grace that can be very, very helpful in, in working out where you actually are yourselves and how you can help other people. So as today is about knowing about ourselves, acceptance of ourselves could be things like renewal and grace, knowing God's forgiveness and reconciliation, out of which we are sustained. 
and we find significance in those and out of it we achieve service and action. Look now at the cycle of works on the next slide. Now in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, we read, for it is by grace you've been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one can boast. So if you look at it backwards from where it says conditional at the top of the page there, acceptance of ourselves built from our achievements is like a house built on sand. Our foundations will be weak and we'll find others a threat. So that's sort of going backwards. Whereas we did read in that um, Ephesians passage that everything is done through grace and not from, uh, not from works. Let's move on to the next slide. Now next, we've already touched on listening um, quite a lot at the beginning and we had an exercise in the first evening. One question is, so how should we be alert to people's negative feelings about themselves? It's mainly done by the use of words about themselves. First thing we actually have on there on the screen is um, inner conflict. I suppose I ought to, or I keep telling myself to do something. There's always a kind of a conflict there. And it's good to try and listen and take on board some of the things that people are actually saying. And secondly, is listening careful, carefully for people who aren't really touching on the real issues that they need to come for healing for. They just hide them. They hide them behind those issues. And then there's the poor self-image saying things like, well, it doesn't really matter about me. I'm nobody, I heard somebody say once. And they end up projecting their insecurities onto others. The next slide, please, Mike. So when we are listening, what are we listening to? Now, you will actually have been with people sometimes when their tones are perhaps monotonous um, or they may be very slow, or it just comes across that they're very, very an anxious. And then, of course, there will be the whole issue of long silences. A good question to ask yourself here is, should we fill those silences or should we wait to let people actually come out with things themselves? Because it could just be significant that they are um, despairing of something they're stunned by something, or maybe even deeply moved by something. And then maybe they're in their thought pattern, they might have their own assumptions about God and expectations from him. Have you ever heard anybody saying, well, the God I know wouldn't do that? Yet frequently we find in scripture that in fact the God that they thought they knew did do what they were afraid of. And then there's the emotions, often tears. But in those tears, I think it's okay to probably just hand over a handkerchief. But really what we want to do is to listen to what they're actually saying. And what is it that's actually prompted those tears? And the other thing is about body language. It can be a bit of a giveaway, but it can also start a conversation. So people will obviously sometimes move their hands in the wrong way, be very anxious, moving their head. You know, I think it's the body language shows an awful lot about how we can actually start a conversation with somebody. And one of the questions, of course, also is how does all the above affect their lifestyle and it could just be that people are incredibly tired 
and their relationships. I wonder how they are. Let's move on, please, Mike, to the next one. Now, what are the helpful qualities in healing? Lots of you will have actually known these words already. And I think to be quite honest, sometimes the words are bigger than the actual actions. So for instance, empathy. Many of you, if you're very, very sensitive in the healing ministry, and I think most people are, we pick up on other people's feelings and that helps us to show understanding, standing alongside them. I spoke to somebody yesterday whose husband has just had a devastating diagnosis. And what she couldn't quite get on board is how she didn't actually realize how badly and how ill he was. So, you know, for it, for, it was for me to actually just listen to her and try and come alongside her. Not saying, well, obviously it wasn't your fault because that wouldn't be fair, but just showing some understanding of the depth and the vulnerability, allowing their pain, her pain, to actually touch us. Also, um, in terms of healing, it's not for us to actually take control of how people are healed. The only person who can actually heal is our Saviour Jesus Christ. And it's true that we might, might not always be able to cope with what we are hearing. But just by resting in the power of the Holy Spirit, sometimes he actually speaks to us and tells us what to say or do next. And I think also the whole balance between the love of God and a sense of humour should truly be acknowledged. I think I have been with people and we've actually been chatting about maybe issues that need healing. But sometimes we both sounds, found something that's been very, very funny. And it's actually fine at that moment to actually laugh with them. And on the next page, please, I think we have another few words on there. OK. And understanding um, what truly is important to them. They'll probably repeat something several times. And you'll, you'll link on to that and you'll find out, you know, the, the things that are sacred to them and also what brings them joy. And the other things there really sort of go without saying in a way that is that we don't judge. We just listen with the ear of Christ. And there will always be the, uh, doubt. It's very normal. And in scripture, we know many people who were just consumed by doubt. Job is one, Elijah, Moses, and of course the famous St. Thomas. Our response is to be, is to trust and to hope and to foster that hope. And to encouraging and to encourage hopefulness. Could we go to the next slide, please, Mike? I think that will be in the right place. And some more helpful qualities. You should have a nice long list by now. Um, but genuineness, our openness can help them. Don't give people reassurances um, that are unhelpful. I think I've lost my page, if you'll just excuse me. Here we are. And um, listening carefully to what or what they want to say, because that for them is the most important thing to actually get out. Try not to interrupt people when they, you can see desperately that they need to get something out. And the empowering side can only be done with God at the forefront. I think our task in the healing ministry is quite often to help people to believe in themselves, knowing that God will stand alongside them. And I think it's quite easy sometimes, however well we actually know ourselves, that we don't always have to have an answer. 
So just an, an um or a nod of the head, we don't have to be directive to actually give them the right answers, even though sometimes they are looking for them. And of course, that word teamwork. Um, in all the healing teams I've been in, we have always had a team um, and always tried to actually have a man and a woman praying together for others. So it's working together to actually help others because nobody has all the gifts. And even though one of us might be taking the lead on in the healing ministry at that particular point, it could be that the other person has has the has a has a better answer than us. I think we're going on next to practical work. If your brain isn't addled by now, <laughs> it could be. Mike, are you picking up this from this point or shall I go on? Um, I'm happy to, or you can, Jackie, what do you prefer? Okay, shall I just um, talk about the practical work? Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then maybe we can talk, maybe after that, after the reflection, maybe you can um, do the praying for the sick in the healing ministry. Will that be sure. important? Sure. Okay. Now, um, now what we actually want you to do is to get into, into groups or into pairs and reflect on, um, on the past section, um, where you think you are strong and where you think you are weak in terms of the qualities you might bring to the healing ministry. And this isn't a test, it's just between two people. And once you've explored these areas, consider how you might develop those areas in need of development if you are to serve people well in the name of Christ. This is really all about knowing yourself. So I think we're going into groups now. Would that be right, Mike? Or just yeah, we'll we'll go into groups now. I know that uh, some of you are uh, kind of like already in a pair or, uh, you know, all sorts of different numbers. So but I'm sure you're uh, old enough to work it out for yourselves how you want to do it. But basically, you've 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 been given a shed load of uh, uh, qualities there associated with healing. We started off with self-awareness and moved into qualities that you need uh, for the healing ministry. So as Jackie said, you know, just have a conversation with one another. Was there anything in there particularly resonated that you thought, yeah, no, that's that's something that, you know, that's where I'm at. That's that's me. And anything where you particularly thought, mm, you know what, I could do with uh, developing that a little bit because uh, that's a, a, an area of uh, weakness or, um, uh, you know, uh, something that I need need to watch. And, and just have a conversation about it and be as uh, as open or as um, kind of, you know, um, as open as you want. I mean, you don't have to bear your soul to one another here, but um, obviously uh, it's helpful if you're real. Okay, so I'm going to put you into groups now. So let me get a... Uh, there we go. I think that's divided into two and about, we'll take about um, 10 minutes, okay? So we'll come back in 10 minutes and then have a conversation. Okay, so here we go. <clears throat> One group has got three in it, so there you go. Bishop Mike, it's Andy Walton. Um, Hi, Andy. Hi. Uh, Jan and I can profitably work together on this. Going into groups has been a bit untidy in some of the times when we've tried to make it look like a pair. Uh, OK, well, I'll have to get the person who will be abandoned by the fact you're not going in there. So wait a sec. Yeah. Uh, oh, well, Peter Mason is the other person, and he's not gone into a group either. Are you there, Peter? Uh, okay, well, if you just go on, go on to mute, um, Andy, and, yeah, and yeah. just have a conversation between the two of you, yeah? Yeah. That'd okay, so you go into mute, and um, I'll try and attract Peter's attention, who appears to be here but isn't. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Great.
Welcome back. We'll just wait for everybody to come back out of the breakout room. Just uh, 30 seconds, I think, before everybody's back. <clears throat> Great. Welcome back, everybody. Um, so uh, just a few minutes now um, to um, uh, for anybody who wants to either report back something from uh, what they were talking about in terms of qualities or self-awareness or really just, yeah, just an opportunity for people to feed in either uh, comments and wisdom or questions. So if you go to the reactions tab at the bottom, and click on that, you'll see there that you can raise the yellow hand. And if you want to raise a yellow hand, then I'll know that you want to speak, because I think I've got three sheets at the moment uh, on my Zoom. So without further ado, uh, Groovy Granny and then uh, Peter and Liz. Groovy Granny. Yeah, I'm, un I'm unmuting. <laughs> um, <laughs> hi, Mike. Hi. Uh, it was I just love saying it. I'm sorry, but if you've got it on there, I have to say it every time. <laughs> so I should change it really, but my grandchildren put that there. <laughs> um, I was, we were just talking about the word team and how there's no I in team. And my other person who spoke to me, who was Christine, said, What we also have to remember is there is a me in team. So, you know, you're talking about there's no I in team. So you're in involve everybody else but actually you have to think about me as well and I thought that was really really important yeah it's that yeah it's that working together so yeah it's both not about kind of like going it alone in an egotistical way but equally well it's not about devaluing and undervaluing your own part in no. the process yeah so it's that that balance and that um, uh, creative tension yeah, yeah absolutely thank you uh Peter Liz Liz Peter Okay, I think um, one of the things we're discussing is we, we normally, we, we have some prayer teams and it's usually male, female. Um, and it's usually uh, very beneficial because not only are we able to, to deal with most things that, that come up, but if, if I'm sort of feeling that I'm not been as non-judgmental maybe as I ought to be, I can have my partner do things. And similarly, we can have that sort of interchange to make sure um, we're hearing from God a bit more and not hearing from ourselves or not projecting anything. So it, I think it, um, it, it's really a healthy thing to, to, to pray in, in pairs, male, female, where possible. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's just so many advantages, aren't there? And, and it's like you're healing double, aren't, hearing double, for instance. You're listening, you know, I, get, I gave the example last week of um, uh, the, 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 the pair who were, were listening to a woman who'd come for healing. And, um, uh, 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 and one of them was uh, kind of like kind of like asking a few questions. And the other one was holding back. But it was the one that holding back that kind of like heard what wasn't being said and therefore was able to ask the critical question, which came out of nowhere to her, her co-healer, which was um, kind of, you know, what's your relationship with your father like? You know, kind of like, well, where did that come from? The other person thought so. But I mean, you know, it's it's you, you get so much more of a, a kind of global view and 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 you're doubly open to the Lord because there's there's two of you and so on. So yeah, right. absolutely. Yeah. Anyone else? All fine with all those qualities, not struggling at all in any area. <laughs> You wry smiles. <laughs> yeah, Andy. It was useful that we were able to talk that together because we could be very honest with each other about what we know of each other's characters. But one of the things that I was conscious of and others may experience too is a temptation to try and complete a task, to, to be task focused. And 
trying to find out, and, and we were discussing, how do you approach that from the viewpoint of maybe limited time if you've got a queue of people perhaps waiting for some form of uh, prayer ministry of healing, and there's a separate discussion about whether those are the same thing. But if you've got people there and waiting, how do you best address it? Mm. Any wisdom on that? Yeah. I mean, I, I can give you an example, uh, which I was going to use later this evening, uh, of, of Bill Johnson, who's very well known, uh, charismatic evangelical coming out of the southern United States. And, and, and um, uh, he, 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 there was, you know, as you say, a, a queue of people coming up for healing you know, on this particular evening, and, you know, there was a limited time, and um, uh, as this, 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 this one person came forward, he heard, he heard the voice of the Holy Spirit quite clearly, saying, uh, don't lay your hands on this person, just as he was about to lay his hands on this person, so he didn't, so he thought, right, okay, I'll pray for this person, then he heard the Holy Spirit say quite clearly, don't pray for this person, so um, he was sort of thought, so what do I do? <laughs> what, what happens now um you know so he just didn't do anything he just stood there and this person stood in front of him um and this this went on for a few minutes um and then the person said i can feel this really heavy oil kind of like moving through me it's like an oil dripping right through me from head to toe and that actually w w was, in fact, what, what, what that person had been waiting for. Uh, and, some, and, and his, the lesson he drew from that was uh, sometimes, you know, being out of control and not knowing uh, uh, is exactly the right way to be. And there is danger in feeling I have to do something in a particular way in order for a, it to work, or B, me to justify my own existence. And the obedience to the spirit can put us in some awkward spots, like just standing there, not knowing what the heck we're supposed to be doing, but just waiting. So that isn't really an answer to your question, Andy, but it's kind of like, it's effectively saying, hold your nerve in the Holy Spirit. You know? Yeah. Um. Anyone else? Um, oh, it's a heck of a long list. Uh, uh, and, you know, uh, uh, there's, there's the danger of the Archangel uh, Gabriel and, you know, job descriptions and all of that. And, and that's not what we're trying to say. But um, by giving you a long list like that, some of them will ring true for you as kind of like areas where you could say, yeah, you know, yeah, OK. And others where, you know, you think, hmm, well, I probably need to have people around me in the team who can, you know, Make sure that my uh, vulnerabilities are not overexposed in those areas, to put it in a very Church of England kind of a way. Mm. Yeah. Anything else, anybody? Jackie, any 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 further comments from you? You're on mute there, Jackie. I'm afraid. Um, I realised the list was really long. And I must be quite honest, when I was actually um, looking at them all and reading them all, I thought, my goodness me, I'm not quite sure I can actually cope with all this lot. Mm. But um, I would actually say that it would be lo worth looking down the list and find out which one you immediately connect with. Um, and then maybe developing that because we all have individual gifts um, in the healing ministry. And that's why we do things as somebody's already said, and uh, uh, Peter and Liz have said, um, in teams and male and female together, just yeah. so we can actually don't have to you don't have to do everything at once. You don't have to pass all these things and have a tick to be in the healing ministry. Yeah, yeah, and and that and yeah, thank you. And and that point. Uh, so for me, one of the things that really resonated is, you know, what we're communicating and the fact that, you know, all the surveys suggest that um, uh, the majority of our communication is nonverbal. Mm. Actually, you know, 38 percent of it is tonal. 
I mean, Dostoevsky, the great Russian spirituality writer, said this. He said, you know what people think of you, not by what they're saying. Don't listen to what they're saying. Just listen to the tone they're using. (laughs) You know, Um, and, um, you know, and the fact that, you know, actually so, so, so relatively little Mm. the speech itself. On the other hand, we also know what Paul says that, you know, faith comes through hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. So if 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 the verbal words are the ones soaked in the spirit, then, well. Mm different kettle of fish but yeah but we did you know what what, what we're communicating uh, uh, uh and and therefore you know the importance of being genuine yeah. being you know uh, being people of integrity and honesty with with all of this is really important yeah. one of my grandchildren who is six said um a couple of uh, weeks ago to us on zoom nana you sound like you've actually got your cross voice on <laughs> And I thought actually that was in terms of the healing ministry, that's actually quite interesting. So I said, oh, I'm sorry, darling, I don't, didn't mean that. It's just that granddad just put an ice cube on my back. <laughs> that's the way it was. So I was cross. Fair enough. <laughs> it was interesting how he immediately picked up on that. Um, and so will everybody else when we're actually praying with them or being alongside them. Yeah, yeah, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. Great. Um, okay. Well, we're going to take um, a tea break. So we'll come back at five past eight. Okay. So uh, take a tea break and catch you in a bit. And I'm going to switch off the recording now. Uh, so do remind me to oh, pause recording. Recording. One minute before five past. So just hang on for a minute. Okay, well, um, so let's resume. So remember, this session is about uh, developing helpful skills and attitudes. Um, So I want to go on now from something general to something quite specific, which is uh, praying with the sick in the healing ministry. Okay, praying with the sick in the healing ministry. So let's have a look at that. And I'm going to, again, endeavour to share the screen. Um, So we'll go through a few slides and then we'll have some conversation and stuff. So I'm hoping you can see that okay. Yeah, Jackie's nodding, so I'll take that as yes, you can see that okay. So praying with the sick in the healing ministry. I was sick and you visited me. Um, And I'm thinking here, I guess, both about the, the sick who come to us for healing and the sick to whom we go. Uh offering prayer for them and uh, fellowship and comfort. Um, and that could be in hospital, uh, could be at home, of course, uh, could be any, any number of, of locations. Um, and I guess um, one of the things to say, uh, the picture you've got there is of somebody who actually is um, dying and um, you might say um, it's a bit of an odd picture to have if you've got, you know, if you're talking about the healing ministry. Um, But um, there can be healing in and through our dying, of course. Uh, There can be, for instance, uh, remarkable reconciliation uh, at a time like that. Um, Our defences can be down in such a way as to allow allow things to shift within us that have been solidified like concrete over the years. Um, There can be a a time of deepening relationship with God as parts of us are are falling apart, other parts of us are being put together afresh. Um, Kennedy Tom, who um, you may have heard of, he was chaplain to um, Burswood Christian Center for healthcare and ministry in the early 90s. He died in, in 2008. And um, he, he wrote about um, the process of dying and healing. And he wrote this, 
um, he says, there comes a moment in everyone's life when it seems there can be no more healing. We are all bound to die. Paradoxically, the gospel teaches that this fact, so far from being the ultimate disaster, is the point of ultimate healing. As Jesus entered on his passion, he said, now is the son of man glorified and God is glorified in him. The passage through death to life eternal may be terrifying and painful, but it has been opened for us by Jesus, who as healer and friend accompanies us on the way. One of the ways in which we can prepare for this time is to support and pray for and with the dying. In so doing, we help both ourselves and them to face up to mortality and to look beyond to what lies in store. So let's not think that um, the work of the healing ministry ceases because we are dealing with situations um, of death and dying. So moving on, let's talk a little bit about um, sacramental healing. Um, uh, unfortunately, uh, people kind of associate um, sacramental healing with the, the phrase the last rites um, and therefore uh, immediately assume, oh dear, it's bad, is it? I'm going to die. Um, I, I, I remember a minister talking about um, how um, he, he was in hospital and he'd gone to see the husband and he came out from the husband to talk to the wife in the waiting room and said, well, uh, uh, they said some things and then he said, so can I pray for your husband? And she said, oh, no, it's not that bad, is it? Um, in other words, it was kind of like, you know, when you're at the end of the rope and it's the last thing you do is to pray when actually I would sincerely hope that as Christians, we might think pray first, not teach first, but pray first. You know, it's po possibly a sign that you know, we're people of, of faith. Um, but if you read this passage from James, this isn't about the dying at all, is it? Um, are any among you suffering? They should pray. Are any cheerful? They should sing songs of praise. Are any among you sick? They should call for the elders of the church and have them pray over them, anointing them with oil in the name of the Lord. The prayer of faith will save the sick and the Lord will raise them up and anyone who's committed sins will be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another so that you may be healed. The prayer of the righteous is powerful and effective. Now, notice in the book of James, it's not said what that healing will look like and how it is that we will be saved. It may be in and through our illness or from our illness but the Lord will raise them up. But also notice that there's something important here about uh, the forgiveness of sins and the confession of sins, isn't there? That's all in the mix here. Um, I'm fond of uh, quoting um, the missionary, uh, Jonathan Goforth, who uh, was a missionary in China at the turn of the 20th century, uh, at a time of great revival in China, a time of uh, an amazing movement of the Holy Spirit and of healings and such like. And he said what triggered it, what triggered it was when the missionaries confessed to one another their sins, their sins of jealousy and envy and competitiveness and the such like, their meanness of heart and spirit towards one another. And in confessing that, there was a release of the Holy Spirit that actually began to snowball. So um, just be aware uh, in this passage from James, in which, which is one of the passages from which we root sacramental healing through, through the use of oils and the such like, that um, actually uh, there's the issue of confession here and the forgiveness of sins too. So um, from James and other passages too, we... Uh, get the anointing with oil associated with healing and the healing of the sick. It's not just James. In Mark 6, uh, the, uh, the, the 12 are sent out to anoint with oil. It's a, it's a point easily missed, but that is one of the things that they are sent out to do. And of course, um, the Good Samaritan uses oil and wine with uh, the man who's uh, been mugged. Um, and in scripture, we, we should notice also the link between anointing 
and showing mercy, the link between anointing and showing mercy. The Greek eleison, have mercy, you know, Kyrie eleison, eleison, has the same root as eleon, which means olive tree or the oil from it. And you'll remember in Genesis how the dove, the, the final dove that uh, Noah sends out, comes back with a twig. But it's uh, noteworthy that it is a twig of the olive tree, the mercy tree. Similarly, as I say in the Good Samaritan parable, olive oil is what soothes and mercifully enables the healing of the man. Um, so olive oil in scripture is symbolic of God's mercy, um, uh, the God who is always and everywhere for us, not against us. So that's one of the reasons that oil is, is, uh, is used for anointing. Um, and anointing is part of, uh, you know, what we can offer as a church. Um, anointing was, of course, something that happened in the Old Testament, but it happened in the Old Testament mainly to kings and priests. They were anointed. Oil was poured on their heads to symbolize God's grace coming upon them to enable them to do what they couldn't do within their own human capabilities. In fact, that's really quite a good description of God's grace, isn't it? God's power to enable us to do and be that which of ourselves we cannot do or be. So, um, and of course, who is the one par excellence, who is the anointed one? who is enabled to do and be beyond all human capacities, well, the anointed one of God, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ. So Christos, yeah? And of course, we, we find in Acts that Jesus was the one anointed with the Holy Spirit and power. And if you look at Jesus' manifesto in Luke 4, which um, is a riff off Isaiah 61 and other Old Testament passages, what do we find? The spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me. He has anointed me to bring good news to the poor, proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. So it's perhaps unsurprising in the light of all of this that actually we anoint within the church and we anoint with the, the oil and olive oil in particular. So within the Church of England, and I know there are other churches represented tonight, but I can only really speak for the Church of England, um, uh, we um, use olive oil and on Maundy Thursday we set that olive oil aside by blessing it and normally it's a, a, a bishop that blesses it. And, and those oils, there are three different oils. There's the oil of baptism, the oil of catechumens, and the oil uh, for ministry to the sick. And, and, and for its use in baptism, that echoes the kingly and the priestly aspects that I've mentioned. For catechumenates, it's, it's, it's a reminder of our discipleship. So it's a reminder that oil was used by athletes in those days. And we are running the race, as Paul puts it, of discipleship. And also for ministry to the sick, which, as I say, is not about the last rites, but how God's care is communicated to us in ways which are resonant with scripture and in ways which are uh, tactile and thus uh, comforting and visceral and physical. Um, and as I say, perfumed oil is sometimes used at confirmation and ordination chrism um, for the setting apart of um, particular people for God's purposes, just as kings and priests were in the Old Testament. So that's some of the background to this idea that when you come to see to, to services where, for instance, so on Maundy Thursday, if you come to the cathedral for the uh, blessing with the oils in the side chapel after receiving communion, you have the option to be anointed. And, and so this is a little bit of background about why that anointing takes place as part of the healing ministry. Um, and in in Anglican public worship, 
a bishop or priest uh, normally pr presides and blesses the oil unless you're in a situation of emergencies uh, and lay ministers can anoint. And, and the signing uh, for anointing is regularly with the cross on the head and or on the hands. Some people get a bit sort of uh, precious about um, saying, oh, no, you don't want to anoint people on the hands because that should be reserved for ordination. I'm not particular. I don't see where they get that from scripturally. And I don't, you know. I think it's very helpful to anoint on the hands as well as on the forehead myself. In fact, you know, I think the more oil, the better personally. But anyway, um, <clears throat> so um, but this idea about on, on the head as well is for those of you who are really interested, an echo of uh, perhaps Revelation 7, 3, where it speaks of the servants of God being sealed upon their foreheads, sealed upon their foreheads. Revelation 7, 3. Uh, so in baptism, for instance, we are sealed as servants of God. And in confirmation, I always say after confirming, be sealed with the seal of the Holy Spirit. So um, just FYI. So that's a little bit about anointing, which is another kind of um, part of the offer we make. There's also the laying on of hands, isn't there, in the healing ministry? And here are a few scriptural references to this practice. You'll recall Jesus early on laying on hands on Simon's mother-in-law. Uh, and she immediately, well, in Mark's gospel, she immediately bounces back up and gets on with the serving the shepherd's pie, which seems a little <laughs> less than merciful. But I'm assuming that she was utterly healed and therefore ready to rock and roll again. Um, <clears throat> um, James, uh, I've already mentioned before. Lay, lay hands on the sick who will recover in Mark, the post-resurrection life. And then Paul in Malta, of course, uh, putting his hands on um, Publius's father. So you've got examples there of this uh, practice of laying on hands as part and parcel of the healing ministry. Now, of course, you've got to be careful um, with, with, with the laying on of hands. And we live in an era where there is um, hyper anxiety about uh, uh, the invasion of uh, physical space. Um, and um, you, before even thinking about this, you need to be clear beforehand uh, and certainly say in the cathedral on a Maundy Thursday, there is a place for the anointing and there's a place for laying on of hands. So people know before they come forward that, that you know, uh, whether they're putting themselves forward for the laying on of hands. In other situations, you need to be very clear about asking permission and whether that will be helpful or not. Uh, we've talked about undertaking this in pairs, and male and female. Um, and um, normally, if appropriate, uh, you'd lay hands lightly, um, normally on the head the sh or the shoulder. If, if it was if it's something like the elbow or something, it could be on the affected part. But very often the, be the best place to, to do it is on the shoulder or somewhere like that. Yeah. Key, key, as it says in the middle there, you want to avoid embarrassment and certainly want to avoid uh, any scandal or the such like. Uh, but it is really, you know, something that, 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 that helps a lot. I remember reading Michael Main, who was the former dean of Westminster Abbey, who uh, came down with ME as just as he was leaving his job as a vicar in Cambridge to become dean of Westminster Abbey and was laid up in hospital for many weeks. And he said uh, there were many, many different Christians that came to see him. Uh, and he said there were, oh, there were precious few that overcame their embarrassment to offer prayer with him, which is a bit salutary. And he said, and the ones that did, the, the, the difference that it really made was, was when they did lay their hands upon me, because he said, you feel so isolated when you are ill the way I was ill. And um, it was something about breaking into my isolation at a time like that, that after having that experience, I resolved whenever and wherever, at least to offer that ministry to those who were in my care as a sick person. So, you know, this can be this can be a powerful and important um, uh, well, uh, well, tool is the wrong word, a gift of God for us to, to, to utilize. So, um, so anointing and laying on of hands. Um, and then also, of course, uh, there are plenty of prayers around. And I think you've probably got some of these um, um, either um, in your um, 
participant's handbook or, uh, you know, maybe even in your brain. Um, it's not a bad idea to have one or two lodged in your memories. Yeah. Um, and this, this is a prayer for the laying on of hands in, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, who laid his hands on the sick, that they may be healed. And we lay our hands upon you. We, assuming there's more than one of you, that this is undertaken in a pair. May almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit make you whole in body, mind, and spirit, give you light and peace, and keep you in life eternal. Amen. Um, and... Um, different kinds of prayers so this is one from common worship which is kind of similar to that one uh, but you can see how it is um, and asking uh, yep and then another one there from the Iona community spirit of the living God present with us now may sorry there should be a may somewhere there may the spirit of the living God present with spirit of the living God present with us now Enter you body, mind, and spirit, sorry, and heal you of all that harms you in Jesus' name. Amen. And uh, there are plenty of uh, prayers out there, and I'm sure you could find some that kind of uh, go with the grain of, uh, of your own kind of um, way of praying. This one, um, Source Unknown, um, a little bit, bit more formal. Um, but um, and this one is for the anointing with holy oil as you're anointed with this holy oil. So may our heavenly father grant you the inward anointing of the Holy Spirit. So that's beautiful. It's how how the external oil is a genuine sacrament. In other words, it's it's an outward and visible sign of an inward and invisible grace. And this prayer makes that point that actually the oil it's not the external oil that's doing it. But this is symbolic of the Holy Spirit that's, uh, you know, we're, we're invoking to, to work in you at this time. Um, I won't take too long over these prayers because you've got them and you can mull them over. And again, another prayer for anointing there. Uh, but I love that combination, grant you the riches of his grace, his wholeness and his peace. And that can be really important to pray for God's peace in the midst of all of this, because um, uh, there can be a lot of anxiety, a lot of restlessness uh, and a lot of uh, mental anguish around um, feeling, you know, oh, is this God punishing me or, you know, all of that stuff that we were talking about earlier about low self-esteem and, and blame and, and, and the such like. Another prayer there. As outwardly and with sacramental oil, your body is anointed. So may almighty God, our father, inwardly anoint your soul. So you can see that has similarities to the one we mentioned a bit earlier. And that's from uh, Marylebone Parish Church, which has got a good website if you're interested in looking at further resources and a good website, particularly on the healing ministry. Um, so, so you might want to check that out at some point. So there are a few prayers um, and we can we can talk about those in a bit if you want. But let me just move on to a few issues arising that, that can arise as we engage in prayer for the sick and with the sick and visit the sick. So <clears throat> some issues arising. Questioning. I can't understand why this is happening to me. How can God let this happen? Um, when I was a vicar um, in London, I um, uh, friends of mine who I've been at university with, um, Kate and Pete, they were married, and um, Kate um, found out uh, when she was pregnant with her third child that she had a, a brain tumour. And she was given less than a year to live. Uh, Kate wasn't a Christian. Uh, she asked if she could see me. And I thought, oh, yikes. So um, I know because I thought I know Kate and I know what's coming. And I was right. There was a lot of questioning and a lot of anger uh, uh, in Kate about this. How can your God allow this to happen? 
what on earth is going on? And don't give me the, those platitudes about this, that and the other and da 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 and da 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 And it, it, uh, it went on and on. And Kate was a bright cookie, you know? She was uh, nobody's fool. And um, it was, uh, yeah, it was, there was a lot to um, take from her questioning. And, you know, at the time, um, I remember being in listening mode and actually saying very little, because actually, even if I'd given a completely robust and uh, watertight defence of, of God's activity in the world, I don't think that she was in a receptive mode of mind. What I do remember saying was that, um, you know, my mother had died of cancer at the age of 46. And, that, you know, it made me deeply question my own faith. Um, but I, you know, but paradoxically, it led me to a place of deeper faith, not less faith, but that, you know, I appreciated that it could go both ways, uh, you know, at a time like that. Um, but, but the other thing that I mentioned was that, that something that um, a priest had told me, which, which was that uh, strange as it seems, the two royal roads to God, the two royal roads to God, fast tracks to God, appear to be suffering and the way of wonder and beauty, uh, despite the fact that, you know, suffering can lead you in the opposite direction. And I don't know if that had anything to do with what she did next, but um, because she only had a year to go, I think she wanted to, to, to pursue her, her, her loves uh, and her loves apart from her family included singing. So, and guess what was the only possibility for singing in her village? The church choir. So she got involved with the church choir, which caused me immense grief because she used to sing at Evensong and listen to all these Old Testament passages. And so started battering me with all of these things that they were saying about God in the Old Testament. So, um, you know, I wasn't particularly grateful that she was singing the, in, the, in the choir there. But strange as it strange as it may seem um uh, you know I, uh, lots of us were praying for kate and she was very happy to be prayed for and um she didn't she didn't die within a year in fact she lived 10 years uh, beyond that and was able to bring up her 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 third child essentially to the age of 11 and she found a faith in and through being in that church choir and I remember asking her, you know, how did you come to faith, given how hostile you were when you were first kind of diagnosed? And and she she, she didn't really have a kind of um, rational explanation. But she said, you know, week after week, sitting in that church and looking at the cross. It just just became apparent to me that um, God's love for me and Jesus for me was there on the cross. Uh, and, and um, you know. I, uh, it's, yeah, it's just um, incontrovertible and unquestionable for me. So uh, what am I saying by all of that? I suppose what I'm saying is, you know, hang in with the questioning, you know, hang in with the questioning, you know. And, you know, as, as you were saying, Liz, the other week, you know, we, we, what we need to do is to put our own experience next to the experience of those who are questioning and saying, well, this is, this is where it went for me and this is what it is for me. And I appreciate your experience is different. But, you know, we, we can still witness in the midst of that kind of, you know, difficulty and indeed hostility. And who knows how God is at work in and through that. But as sure as eggs is eggs, God is not going to be at work and we scurry away and hide from it. So so questioning uh, and indeed anger. Um, and then and then shame can be something that arises because some people can feel uh, deeply ashamed that they are sick and unwell or somehow feel um, that they're letting the side down or that if they've not been healed, they, they are kind of, you know, a person of, of, of little faith or something. 
on top of the kind of often indignity of various kinds of illnesses and the the, the danger of, of self-disgust and the such like. So so we need to be really sensitive to that, I think, as a, as a possibility and, and really be careful about our language and our way of being with people who may be feeling shame. Um, and I think I mentioned before about, you know, Jesus uh, and he... He never ramped up the shame. He always kind of like pr provided a, a, a pinprick to the balloon-like nature of shame. I think of, you know, his calling of, of Matthew and um, goes into the place of Matthew's greatest shame, uh, the tax office where he's ripping people off and um, uh, disgracing his people and his family name and his village's name. And Jesus doesn't shame him. He doesn't abandon him. He doesn't do violence to him. He just breezily says, follow me follow me which also by the way means i really want to be with you matthew and uh we've got things to do together and and one of the things i think um that we can offer to someone who's feeling shame is our presence and, and being really present to them and being available and being accessible because those who are feeling shame will feel like you know they're being you know they're shunned and being you know any sense of being shunned will add to that so um and then resignation can be another there's nothing i can do and and there's that, that sense of despair and again what what do we see how does jesus deal with um despair or that kind of resignation be interested to know your responses to that um i think of mary at the uh tomb on the third day and she must have been despairing because not only was jesus dead but now they'd stolen his body um and jesus appears to her and says her name and it's interesting with with thomas who dis is despairing in a different way but whose despair kind of like comes across as anger and Jesus um, shows him his wounds. How is the risen one recognized? The risen one is recognized by his voice and by his wounds. Um, what, is, what does that kind of like communicate to us in terms of how we are to engage with those who are, you know, resigned or despairing? What is it for us to enable them to hear Jesus calling their name, Mary? Um, and, and then, of course, another issue that might be arising, and I put this one in because it's completely different from the rest and certainly kind of like um, discombobulated me when I came across it, uh, is concern for others. Um, are, that, that actually, you know, people aren't always negative in the midst of their sickness, but are remarkable witnesses. I think of Edna Greenup, who, who, who when I was in Deptford as a lay worker, I remember visiting her. She was 90 years old with terminal cancer. And she didn't want to speak about her illness at all. What she wanted to speak about was the vicar in the parish who was having some really challenging pastoral situations and was really keen that we were praying for most of the time I spent with her for him. And that was not avoidance. That was not denial. That was sincere, loving other regard. And we shouldn't be surprised at that. What do we hear in Matthew 25? You know, Jesus says, when I was sick, you visited me. <laughs> when I was sick, you visited me suggesting that the Christ-like ministry here can come from the one who is sick, which was absolutely the case with Edna Greenup. So, you know, be prepared for visiting Jesus when, when you visit the sick. Um, the American author um, and pastor uh, Eugene Peterson uh, was struck in the stories of the resurrection by how the angels at the tomb said to the disciples, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. Yeah, Mark 16, is it eight or seven? One of those anyway. Uh, he is going before you to Galilee. There you will see him as he told you. 
And that caused Peterson to look again at his uh, pastoral visiting uh, in the light of that. So because he was often very anxious when he was going to places like hospital about what he would say. Um, you know, what, what am I going to do when I get there? Because it's mm, crumbs. It's a bit of a challenging scenario. Um, and he kept thinking about this. The risen Lord has gone before me. There I will see him. He is risen. He is going before you to Ipswich Hospital. There you will see him as he told you. So what, what the conclusion he came to through this was that actually uh, what, what, what we need to be doing with our pastoral visiting is being alert to what the risen Lord is doing and saying. Uh, so there's something about the prevenience of grace here and a sense of, uh, of looking for what the risen Lord is already up to rather than feeling I have to bring something to this situation. I have to do something. I have to provide something. The posture he suggested in the light of that uh, resurrection narrative, he's going before you to Galilee, there you will see him as he told you, is that Jesus is already there. Jesus is already in the room. And there's something about our being attentive. So I think that's quite helpful. I don't think it's the whole story, but I think it's very helpful if you're feeling pressurized to somehow perform that actually the risen Lord has gone ahead of you. So what is it for us to be listening and watching and joining in with it? And Henri now on uh, make, makes uh, another important point in relation to this pressure to, uh, you know, I must do something. He says, as busy, active, relevant people, we want to earn our bread by making a real contribution, doing something to show that our presence makes a difference. And so, he says, we ignore our greatest gift, our ability to be there to listen and to enter into solidarity with those who suffer. And that's an important reminder. Our anxiety about ourselves and how we are doing can get in the way of genuine attentiveness. And therefore, it can get in the way of the Holy Spirit too. Be ye not anxious. Our Lord doesn't say that because he's being a therapist there. It's a critical part of seeking the kingdom of God. <laughs> and our anxiety, which is fear of loss of reputation or image or all the other stuff, be not anxious. Be not anxious. One of my favorite saints, um, St. Seraphim of Saroff, who, who was a Russian saint, he noticed that when he started to, as he put, try to make a contribution in pastoral conversations, the spirit didn't seem to be very active. And he said it was, it's difficult to describe this, but it's almost as if once we look away from ourselves and look away from our own performance and look in compassion and attentiveness to the person while silently prayerful, that, he noticed, was when the spirit appeared to be doing the spirit's work. So I think you get the point. Um, and then finally, because we've given you a, a, a huge list, well, not, not finally, actually, two, two more slides. <laughs> um, we've given you lots of lists. Um, knowing what to say. Um, I mentioned earlier on Bill Johnson and, and being stopped in his tracks. And actually, sometimes uh, you just got to be just stand there. Um, you know, and um, sometimes questions can be helpful. Uh, but we need to avoid interrogations. Um, sometimes uh, it's important to, uh, well, it's always important to listen. Um, we need to accept the emotions that are coming out. With Kate, it was difficult to stay with that, those emotions, but it was really important to do so. Uh, maybe allow the person to, you know, um, be the psalmist. That could be a psalm of orientation, of disorientation, or of reorientation. You know, it could be a psalm of lament, and God is big enough. Or it could be a psalm of praise. And we need to avoid pitfalls. 
So for instance, whatever we do, we are not there to predict courses of recovery. Uh, we're not there to talk about the details of our own particular illnesses. Uh, we're not there to be uh, nosy or to appear to be nosy. Uh, we're not there to um, be voyeurs. Um, we're not there to fill every gap created by silence. Avoid some of those pitfalls uh, for the sake of the quality and the depth of the relationship. And prayer is important, and the offering of prayer is important. Uh, I, I, you know, I was in hospital a few years ago, and I was astonished how few people offered to pray for me. I don't know if it's because I'm a bishop or what, but, you know, I was kind of like, come on. I wasn't as rude as Stanley Hauerwas, who, when the chaplain was talking to him when he was in hospital, said, after he got a bit impatient, unless you're going to pray for me, get the hell out of here. <laughs> So, uh, yeah, but, um, you know, we can offer prayer in an open way and, you know, it, it doesn't have to be pressurized. But, you know, if we're not offering it, I don't think you'll find that other people are going to be offering it. So, you know, um, and of course, you know, we need to ask what, what it is that, that they'd like prayer for, because maybe actually what they're really worried about is their pet border collie. We don't know what's happening. I don't know what's happening to Shep, <laughs> you know. Um, we can also offer to pray for them in church or on the day of the operation, etc. And that's important. But but whatever you do, don't don't avoid praying for them at the time by saying I'll pray for you somewhere else, because that colludes with this idea that religion is something private that we do away from the public gaze. And I'm really keen that we kind of like reclaim prayer as a public act um, and touch touch can be quite important it needs great sensitivity but just touching somebody on the soul, shoulder or holding a hand um, can can be really important um, and leaving how we leave is also really quite important so we need to think about how we're leaving people um, you know um, you leave when the visit's over <laughs> to be banal <laughs> but leave positively don't sort of like look at your watch like um over act as anonymous and uh, <laughs> um and uh you know say something that kind of punctures everything that's gone before be careful how you leave so um final slide before we'll have a bit more conversation um the comforter comforter and i'm thinking here of the, uh, of, of the holy spirit and us working with the holy spirit will understand accept emotions come alongside allow the person to set the pace not necessarily need comforting by the patient but offering sensitive witness to hope in jesus christ dame cecily saunders was, was once asked a patient she was the founder of the hospice movement uh, cecily saunders and she once asked a patient what he chiefly looked for in those who were caring for him and he replied quite simply uh, for someone to look as if they're trying to understand me for someone who looks as if they're trying to understand me isaiah 40 comfort comfort my people uh, Comfort is not feather soft, but meant to encourage. And encourage comes from en cœur, to give heart to. Um, and, uh, you know, so therefore it's not just feather soft. Sometimes it can be, you know, like a coach on the sidelines giving us, uh, you know. So um, there's a place for this sometimes in being with those who are unwell. Anyway, I think. We should come back and just have a few minutes of conversation. So let's come back. And here we all are. You're still there. It's always a bit unnerving on Zoom because you don't know if everybody's gone. <clears throat> so um, thoughts, comments, reflections, love to hear your wisdom. Remember, if you go to reactions and uh, 
get on the yellow hand, you can speak a word. Um, so, um, Peter and Liz. Um, I think uh, just thinking about the knowing what to say part, on the sort of trying to get the questions right, um, often found, find it very useful to yet yeah, listen and just reflect back in order to actually have the person really reveal what their uh, issues might be. And on the accepting emotions part, it, sometimes the healing is emotional. And if strong feelings start to come out, it may be because they've been suppressed for a long time. And suddenly it's like uh, uh, the cork coming out of a bottle. And yeah, it can be difficult, but it's really important that you can accept what's, what's coming out. Yeah. And all yeah. that sort of healing to, to then take place. Yeah, and it, it's kind of important um, to both take it personally and not take it personally, isn't it? Mm. <laughs> I mean, when Kate said all that to me, she was saying it to me because I was a priest in the church, you know, so it was personal, but it was also nothing to do with me <laughs> mm. as well, <laughs> you know, and, and kind of like disentangling that. So it's not, yeah. But, and I think you're absolutely right about the reflecting back. You know, sometimes some of the best work we can do in our listening is, as you say, reflecting back and maybe summarising what they've said, which is, you know, really encouraging because people are thinking, flipping heck, they've actually heard what I've said to them. You know, it also uh, gives them a chance to hear what they've said. Yes. And it can be quite simple. It can be just the yeah. key words. Uh, and that works. But the other thing is, is, is making sure that we are vulnerable enough um, to also regularly ask for prayer ourselves. Yeah. Because that, that's a great witness to others that everybody needs prayer. Yeah. Yeah. I think um, there's, a, there's a writer called Andrew Shanks, and he talks about um, the solidarity of the shaken. Uh, you know, in the, in the First World War, Second World War, often in armed conflicts, there's a solidarity between the soldiers because they have a common vulnerability and they know it that, that is rare elsewhere. And I suspect amongst, you know, persecuted Christians, you find that as well. But what, what he's talking about is that um, on the far side of vulnerability, you've got a kind of solidarity together because we know, we, of course, we have a common vulnerability. Who's trying to fool anybody else that we're not vulnerable? But to actually kind of like, yeah make that connection that can really take relationships to a much deeper level very quickly can't it yeah yeah thank you uh ian and then um sharon uh yes yes to do with uh with the vulnerability of of yourselves actually and um being honest I found being honest, like yourself, I've had a couple of people really go at me and my God and Jesus about their condition and uh, terminal illness. And for one of them, he was getting quite irate. And I really just had to be honest with him and just really say, I don't have the answers. Have you asked God? And he went away, still giving it all, but uh, I bumped into him, funny enough, in the street, and uh, because he, he was actually contemplating suicide. I didn't know that at the time when he was talking to me. And uh, he actually said to me the next couple of days after, when I bumped into him, that just saying those words, have you asked God? He felt it, it, it saved him because he went home and ranted and raved at, raved at God. Mm. Obviously, he felt God answering. Mm. Yeah. And he did. He lasted an extra 
uh, five years as well. So that was praise the Lord to that. Mm. And the other thing is um, we had, uh, bless her, a wonderful woman who had uh, super motor neuron disease. And it was a very slow, debilitating disease that just drained her and took her away. But a number of prayer meetings, and especially prayer meetings and healing meetings were there with a group, not just one person, a very solid group. People, not her, but people within that group were being healed. Mm. It was quite amazing. And she was very much part of that. She was saying, Trish, I felt God speaking to you. Just simple words like that. And mm. yes, it, it was happening. It was, a, it was truly amazing. So mm. yes, it does happen that uh, those who are terminally ill, sick in some shape or form, just flow. The healing, healing ministry just flows from them. Yeah. That, that's, yeah. what, that's, been, that's been my witness anyway. Yeah. Yeah. And, uh, you know, I, I'm conscious that that is, that, that is um, a witness that is echoed. Uh, and one or two examples we, we've had in the previous sessions. But absolutely, it seems that um, and what that's about, I'm not quite sure. There's, 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 no. there's no. Paul no. talking about, you know, when I'm weak, then I'm strong. There's mm. um, this sense that, you know, as we're dying, our defenses come down and we become open to the spirit in a wholly uh, translucent way that is that yep. is remarkable. It's paradoxical. But also yep. thank you for your remark about, you know, um, have you asked God? Because sometimes one of the dangers in the healing ministry is we get in the way. <laughs> yep. We need to get out of the way, you know, sometimes. And actually the whole point is the connectivity with our Lord, not, yep. not with us getting in the way as <laughs> Sort of like you know buffer link so you know yeah. that's a really yeah. important reminder so thank you um sharon if it is sharon yeah <laughs> yeah it is um thinking about listening and it brought um a memory back for me and it was of a, a lady who was an extremely private woman and did not want to imp impart to any of the details of what she needed healing for. And it was all to do with relationship. And you know, that relationship would never be repaired. So it was very emotional. And I thought, you know, how am I gonna move forward with this? So and we decided we would have a short service with nobody else around, um, just in the church um, on a Saturday morning. And I, and I said to her, go away and write down all of these things that you just want to bring before God. And I won't read them, just, just write them all down and bring them with you. And when she brought them with her, we put it on this li little metal heart plate that I've got. And before the altar, we burnt it um, before God. And then I said, well, let's go and bury it in, in the graveyard. And, and just as we got to the door, the wind just took it, all the ashes and, and he couldn't write the stuff, you know, and it just went and we just looked at each other and it was just like a total release and it was just wonderful. And it's just um, about being creative as well and mm. how to get, how to help people engage creatively with, with healing. So Yeah. Wow. Lovely example. Beautiful. Yeah. Hmm. I haven't got anything to say to that. That's amazing. <laughs> Nothing to say. Lois. <laughs> yeah, I just wanted to ask you, I, I love the thing you said about um, when people are angry and they're questioning about God and how those awful things can happen to them. And when you said about the, the two royal roads to God, suffering and the way of wonder and beauty, mm. I, just, I just wondered... Um, if there's any chaps, any um, verses in the Bible about that, I can think of one that sort of relates to healing, but I can't think of ones that, that doesn't relate to healing. See what I mean, it's more about the suffering than it is the healing, isn't it? That they, that they then uh, come to God. And I just wondered if there was anything in the Bible that, that you could draw upon at that, if that ever was to happen. 
what the uh, suffering as a way to God. You, yeah, yeah. Yes. Yes. Um, well, I guess. Um, well, it's interesting. This this week we're looking at um, uh, James and John, aren't we? The, uh, the in in the lectionary, uh, you know, the two disciples who um, uh, say, "Can we sit at your right hand in your glory?" Um, and and they appear to have been deaf to the last two chapters of Mark's gospel, where Jesus is talking about the road of suffering. Uh, and just just remember the transfiguration and the bit of glory and and jesus says uh are you sure are you sure you want to do this um you know because um you're gonna have to drink the cup that i drink and be baptized with the baptism i'm baptized with and they say yeah sure we can do that no problem um and then he explains to them that actually following his way is a way inevitably of suffering and and that that's not necessarily sickness though, Lois. And I, I can't think of an example where it's sickness, but that suffering is an inevitability in the Christian way because we are actually called uh, to let go of all sorts of stuff in order to embrace uh, the way in the person of Jesus Christ. And and I think what he's saying to James and John is um, it's not that um, I die and you get to have the glory. It's that actually I die and rise and you get to die and rise with me. And that's hard. But that is the way. That is the way of life. And, and each of us will have to tread quite a different path. But each one of us will have uh, the cross uh, and each one of us will will die. Uh, but and each one of us is called to do that in and with the one who has gone before us and in the power of whom we can do so in ways which are transfiguring of others and ourselves so you know i kind of like so i'm not giving you a, a chapter and verse but i'm saying it seems to me the thrust of, of of jesus whole teaching around the cross and participating in his life and his way and abiding in him and him and us yeah yes thank you that makes sense thank yeah. you very much and and jackie finally you're on mute there, Jackie. Thank you. Um, I was just thinking that when I was a hospital chaplain, we met people there who were very, very vulnerable because they didn't quite know what was going to be happening to them and viewed all, each person as a walking sacrament um, uh, because they were all God's children. And uh, at that point, we always, you know, I think we talked about Morris Maddox saying, God meets us at our point of need, it was in one of our, uh, um, yeah. one of our talks. And uh, I was actually just thinking how very often that um, just seeing somebody who's actually willing to sit alongside them, even um, in a hospital situation where frequently chaplains wear black. I did change that, actually do black um but uh they to um have have having a, a priest alongside you when you're walking into the hospital and you're afraid to go in we found over and over again that people often ask for prayer there and then will you pray for me yeah. will you come and see me in the ward before i have my operation and of course the answer was always yes so and i think earlier on this afternoon we talked about there's a book written um, called the sacrament of the present moment it's facing up to that moment when someone wants prayer at at their most vulnerable mm. yeah yeah That's and kind of availability yeah thank you um it's nine o'clock so we're gonna close and i'll close with one of the prayers we've used if i may um and then um we're same place same time next week at seven o'clock so let's just pray as we close Spirit of the living God, present with us now, enter us body, mind and spirit and heal us of all that harms us. In Jesus name. Yeah. Amen. Amen. Thank you all. Thank you. And see you next week, maybe. <laughs>